Hello and welcome to Food Safety Friday. <laughs> Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. This is the final Food Safety Friday of 2023. And we're delighted to say we're joined by Jesse Leal from AIB International. And today we're going to be talking about how to build a successful sanitation program. And we've got 1,500 registered. So we're looking forward to a great session. Good morning, uh, Jesse. <coughs> Joining us from sunny Arizona. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Uh, very. Uh, thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. We've just been talking about your very nice shirt. Can you just show it there? It's uh, it's uh, what we call in the UK ska music. That black and white check with the band on. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. Very cool. Nice. Uh, what's the weather like, Jesse, in Arizona? Well, for us, uh, it's a little bit cool because we're we're kind of spoiled here in Arizona. So we're used to 65 to 70 degree weather, even in the winter time, and it's in the uh, 50s, which for us is a little cool. But it'll warm up later today and be nice 60 and and great golf weather. Uh, but you know, I was in Philadelphia earlier this week, and it was a little bit cooler there. But uh, we're not used to snow here, so we're we're kind of spoiled out here in Arizona. Well, we're very jealous of you in the UK, anyway, I am, I am. But everybody in the sidebar, tell us where you're joining from. Kelly from New Orleans, Michael from Bretham, Wisconsin, Blessy, Tanzania, Edwin. Literally <laughs> every country from all over the world is represented. So I'm going to play the sponsors' ads now. Thanks to our sponsors for this year for Food Safety Fridays. Uh, we'll be back for the presentation in a couple of minutes. Okay, there we go. So uh, I'll be back for the Q&A later, but for now, I'll hand you over to Jesse. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Well, welcome everybody. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're uh, joining us from. Um, you know, when I was asked to do this uh, presentation, it's uh, something that uh, is kind of very near and dear to my heart. I, I worked in the food industry for 10 years and I worked as a sanitarian for two big companies. And so I did a lot of this work and, and uh, you know, started about 38 years ago. So this is something that uh, I really enjoy talking about and doing and sharing this information, um, you know, with, with customers. So my name is Jesse Liao, as Simon uh, mentioned earlier, and uh, I work for AIB International out of Manhattan, Kansas. And I've been working for them for going on 28 years. I've done about 2,500 food safety inspections all over uh, probably 10 or 11 different countries and continue to do audits, do a lot of seminars, a lot of trainings. 
Um, so what do we look for when we, uh, when we uh, go to these facilities uh, to do inspections? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. One of the biggest uh, issues that we find in the food plants and something that we try to help the food plants at from a sanitary and st- a sanitation standpoint. We work, as I mentioned, all over the world. Uh, we have an office in Europe that do some work in uh, Asia Pacific. And here in the Americas, I've worked in Central and South America, as well as all over the United States. Uh, what's our goal? Well, our goal is to positively impact the food supply chain by promoting food integrity, fostering continuous education, and helping our customers navigate the complexities of the food industry. So what are those complexities that we're talking about in the food industry? Well, let's get started. Okay. So the overview here, um, you know, what type of sanitation issues do you think might cause a 43? And let me explain what a 43 is. So many times when I'm doing these uh, trainings and seminars, I start talking about all these uh, terminology, um, like a 483 and a 482 and, and 40283, which we're going to get into. A 483, what that is, is pretty much like uh, what if, if a police officer stops you if you're driving, it's that ticket you're going to get. It's that violation. Okay. Well, this is from the FDA. So the FDA comes into the food plants. And if you're not in compliance, if they find issues such as uh, sanitation issues, pest control issues, um, any kind of issue that can impact the food products, you may be issued a form 483 and it's official form only from the FDA. Uh, the state agencies like the health departments will not issue that. Although um, health departments now will work on behalf of the FDA here in the United States. Um, you know, and I know we have people from all over the world in this webinar. If you're exporting to the United States, it's also very important to understand the rules and regulations here because you have to comply uh, with the rules and regulations of the USDA and the FDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture and the Federal Drug and uh, Administration, uh, Food and Drug Administration here in the United States. Um, you know, exporting from Canada, from from uh, from India, um, from China, from Mexico, um, they have to have programs in place to ensure that the food products are food safe. Okay. So what is it that the FDA looks for when they come into these facilities? Well, they're making sure that you're in compliance with the laws and regs, okay? They're looking for unsanitary conditions, which is kind of like the topic of our of our webinar today. What is an unsanitary condition? Most people, when you think about an unsanitary condition, think about a plant being dirty. Well, there's a lot of different things that fall under that category of unsanitary conditions. It could be an employee handling a dirty trash can and then going and handling a food product, um, you know, with their gloves. It could be, you know, you handling, uh, you know, trash and rubbish from the floor and then going and handling the food products. It could be insects in the facility that could impact the food products. It could be mold and mildew. So it's not just dirty conditions. It could be uh, metal contamination. It could be glass and brittle plastic issues that get into the product. An oil, uh, oil dripping from a, from a gearbox into the food products. So the FDA looks at the term unsanitary conditions a little bit different than we do, okay? Um, so from 2006 to 2019, sanitary, monit- uh, sanitary monitoring has been in the top five identified findings by the FDA on 483s and regulatory inspections and was number two almost every year in that span. So what does that mean? Well, that means the FDA can come into just about any plant and probably find unsanitary conditions. And there's a number of different types of issues that fall into that category. Um, So what do we have to do as far as in a food plant to make sure that we're making it harder for them to come into our plant and finding these issues that we're gonna get cited a 483 for, okay? Why are these issues identified so often by the FDA? Because of uh, the complexity of the food industry, okay? Um, Also, the lack of education. And what I mean by that is we in the food industry, and I've been in the food industry for going on 38 years, I say and I believe um, we do a phenomenal job of training. We train the employees on, you know, uh, how to clean. We train the employees on good manufacturing practices, which I'm going to get into, which uh, ironically goes right into, um, you know, unsanitary conditions and things that the FDA looks at. But we don't do as good of a job of educating the employees, educating them on why they're cleaning. The reason they're cleaning is from a microbial and insect standpoint to stop these insects from developing in some cases 
depending on what kind of food products you're handling. Um, and I'll break that down here shortly when we get into, uh, you know, the reasons why we clean. So what is this talking about? What is 40283? Well, this is the past. This is the regulation that goes with the GMPs, the good manufacturing practices. And I can speak um, uh, with experience on the fact that I have worked in numerous countries. Every country that I've been to, I've worked in Canada, I've worked in Mexico, I went to Singapore and Malaysia, I worked in uh, Brazil and Argentina. Every company has food safety programs. Every company has cleaning programs. Every company has um, these regulations. Now, they might be a little bit different from one country to the next, but every single country has regulations to protect the food products. Now, there are some other regulations. If you're going to export out of your country to another, another country, you not only have to comply with your regs, you have to comply with that country that you're exporting to as well. Um, I have done a lot of work in Central and South America, and the reason I was there, the reason I was inspecting those facilities and working with them and conducting trainings was they were trying to export their products to the United States, and they wanted to know, what are the rules and regulations that we have to comply with? What is FISMA, like Food Safety Modernization Act, and how does that apply to us? What is that foreign supplier verification program and all these programs that we go and try to help work with these companies on? So we're kind of like the trainers, like, a, you know, if, if somebody's going to drive a car, you go to driving school. We're kind of like the driving school uh, teachers for the food industry. We teach you what the rules and regulations are, what you have to do uh, to make sure and, and stay out of uh, the FDA's crosshairs so that there's not an issue. So getting back to this 402A3, well, this is the past. And what the FDA would do is they would come into these food plants or the health departments, the company's food plants, and they were looking to make sure that you were in compliance um, with the, the, the FDA, uh, good manufacturing practices, the GMPs. So what it states here, and I'm going to read it verbatim, adulteration is determined by credible and verifiable information. A food is considered adulterated if it consists in part of, in whole, or any few, filthy, putrid, or decomposed substances, or is otherwise unfit for food. What does that mean? What that means is in the past, if there was a contamination issue, if there was customer complaints, and I was watching all of the uh, so the uh, sponsors earlier that uh, Mr. Simon put up, and I was watching the, the metal detection and the x-ray and, and the uh, testing, uh, you know, for all of the things we do to protect our food products and our plants. And I've worked with a lot of those companies. And um, what's interesting is uh, in the past, okay, from, uh, you know, and I'm talking the first good manufacturing practices that were developed in uh, 1906, and then they were modified in 1938, and then again in 2011. So these rules and regulations have been around for a long time. But what this rule or this law talks about is that they had to find contamination in the product to consider it contaminated. So you had to find the insects in the product. If a customer complaint uh, came in or if a customer complained that that food was contaminated, that because they had the foreign material in the product, the FDA would have to go in and find that foreign material. If someone said, I had glass in the product. They would literally have to go in and find the glass in the product or find evidence of where that possibly, uh, you know, uh, became contaminated. Um, and that, that, that is the rule in the past. Well, do you know how hard it is to find adulteration and contamination in food products? I've done about 2,500 food safety inspections all over the world. And I'm looking across here and we got folks from Canada and we got folks from Massachusetts and, and Texas and New Orleans and people from, you know, uh, Iowa and other parts of the, of, of the United States and have done parts of uh, audits in other parts of the world as well. You know how hard it is to find contamination in all of those audits, 2,500. I've only found direct contamination maybe in about three or four, but I've had hundreds of plants that have failed audits. Well, how is it possible that they fail an audit if you didn't find the contamination? Well, I'm going to get into that in the next one, uh, next uh, uh, regulation, which is 402A4. Okay, so what does that mean? Product is adulterated after the failure has already occurred, or they pretty much needed to find the contaminated uh, contaminants in the product. So this is not a nice thing to comply with, folks. This is the law, like it states, states there, and I put it in bold red. This is the law. OK, we cannot have adulterants in our food products. Well, now we get to the present and the future. So we talked a little bit about um, contaminants in the product, um, you know, as far as finding glass or insects in the product. 
um, finding metal in the product, finding an, uh, an undeclared ingredient, <clears throat> excuse me, in the product. Now we get to the present and the future. So in 1938, they modified and changed the regulations. In 1959, uh, HACCP was, was in, uh, introduced into the food industry. Uh, 2011, FISMA was passed as a law in, in the United States, not in other countries, but the United States. But how does that affect some of these other um, countries? So, you know, I see, uh, you know, Edwin from Tanzania, you know, uh, if you want to export your products to the United States, you have to comply with um, the food safety regulations here in the U.S. OK, well, so they made this change because they said, you know, you know, just like the example that I gave. Um, 2,500 inspections and maybe three or four times. I've actually found metal in the product several times. I found insects in the product. I found foreign material, or I found uh, uh, an ingredient that was not supposed to be there based on some conditions that I saw. I saw some unsatisfactory or, or unsanitary conditions. So now let's take a look at the present and the future. 402A4, which are, is uh, the regulation that the GMPs are, are associated with, a food shall be deemed to be adulterated if it has been prepared, packed, or held under insanitary conditions where may, it may have become contaminated or where it may have been rendered injurious to health. What does that mean? Okay, so we saw 40283, we have to find contamination in the product. Now we're looking at this 40284, which is now and in the future. So you can actually be in violation of one or the other, or you can be in violation of both. An example of that would be if I come into your facility, if one of my colleagues come into your facility, or if the FDA or, you know, the Department of Health comes into your, uh, your facility, depending on what part of the world you're in, you know, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or the Secretary of Health in Mexico and some of the other agencies in, across the world, um, they don't have to find contamination in your product, okay? Um, you know, if they do find it, you're in violation of 402A3, if they don't find contamination, but they find conditions, if they find flake and paint directly over the product, okay, if they find an, a gearbox located over the product zone, and there's evidence, we don't even have to see it leaking into the product. If I see where uh, the oil, there's oil residue on the bottom frame, the bottom uh, of the gearbox, that's all I need for that to be an unset. That's all the FDA needs for, the, for it to be an unset. Now, some of you may think, well, that's awfully strict. Boy, that's really hard for us as far as in the food industry because things happen. And I worked in the industry for 10 years, so I understand all of the, the battles that you all fight every day. But we have to understand, folks, we're making food for human consumption. We're making food products for, for infants. We're making food for the elderly. Uh, we also inspect uh, facilities that make food products for, for pets, uh, for the pet food industry. And the same regulations apply there. So what does this mean? Okay, well, product is adulterated if conditions exist where the product may have become adulterated. Now, earlier this week, I was doing some consulting in Pennsylvania. Um, and the reason I was there is they had an inspection and the inspection didn't go very well. And in, in talking to the group that I was teaching there for a couple of days, they were saying, Jesse, we don't understand why we lost all these points in our audit. The auditor never really found any, any, any direct contamination. And I said, well, what were some of the things that were found? Well, they found some uh, cleaning issues. They found storage practice issues. Those are all potential unsa uh, unsanitary conditions, okay? And I explained to them, you don't have to find insects in a product. You don't have to find the metal in a product. You don't have to find the condensate dripping into the product. All you have to find is those conditions that exist that could impact the products, okay? So now, uh, reason to believe is the equivalent to unsanitary conditions that could lead to adulteration. What does that mean? The FDA has reason to believe that that condensate over the product zone is going to drip into the product. Why is that an issue? Okay, it's just moisture. Well, it's not potable water. So one of the regulations that we have um, at AIB is we audit all of your different programs to protect your products. One of them is you have to use uh, you know, have to have verification and documentation that the potable water that you're using is from a reliable source. Condensation is not potable water. Um, if that surface that that condensate on is dirty, <clears throat> you may be dripping microbial, uh, you know, uh, spores into the product. Um, uh, what if it's an oily surface? What if it's a dirty surface? What if there were allergens present and that condensate builds up on that, uh, the, those allergens that are, that are built up on the equipment? 
and then drips into the product. And what it happens if you are not running a product that contains those allergens at the time? That is a class one recall situation, okay? Um, so very, very important. And, and as I put again in bold there, um, this is the law. This is just not a nice thing to do, okay? Uh, this is the law. We have to comply with this. And I had to I had to comply with this when I worked in the food industry for 10 years. Um, I, I got visits from AIB and I had visits from the FDA. And we were always nervous because you never know what you're going to find in a plant. You never know if someone did their job and did the proper cleaning. We were never going to know if the employees were you know, properly washing their hands after they got done going to the bathroom or handling something that was soiled or dirty. Those are all examples of unsanitary conditions. So what does the, uh, what does the food, uh, what does the public think our plants look like? What do you think that the public thinks that the food plants conditions are um, and how the products that, you know, everything that you have in your house, in your pantry, in your refrigerator, what do those folks think that your plants look like? Well, do they think that it looks like this? So if I were to walk into this facility, it would not take me very long to start writing up a number of violations. So what do you all see in this picture? You see the beam there, uh, the white painted beam that, that, that off to the right side of the corner of the uh, picture. Notice the flake and paint that's missing where somebody was going through with these, uh, uh, these trays and, and the racks and whatnot, hitting that beam. Where did that flake and paint go? Where is that flake and paint? Well, if you can remember now what I just stated about 40284, reason to believe. So the FDA is going to say, I have reason to believe that that flake and paint that's not on that beam is now in that product. What about the box that's sitting there on the floor that's open? Okay. Would you set your food products on the floor? Now, unfortunately, I do have to tell you that some bakeries, okay, when you're running and making baked products, um, some of the conditions may not look, uh, you know, uh, likely would like it to look. You're going to have flour present in different areas. The floor is going to have flour on it. It's a bakery, okay? You're going to have that airborne, the flour airborne in different areas. What are some of the other issues that we see in this picture that could be an unsanitary condition? Um, it's kind of hard to see, but if you notice the two uh, racks there with the white uh, basket in it, it says edible. What they have in those is dough. So dough that maybe they pulled out or excess dough and they put it in those trays. Well, if you look in the middle of the picture, you have this uh, a black container with the red top on it. That's a trash can. Well, right next to that trash can where you're throwing rubbish and debris in there from the floor, you've got this tray that says edible. You have dough that's literally within inches of a trash can. You could even throw scrapings from the floor. There could be insects that we throw in there. And it's literally inches from our food product that we're going to make maybe possibly use and re, uh, mix in that mixer uh, that the employee off to the right-hand side there is working on. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Would you put, if you're making food at home, would you set the plate on the trash can? Would you have the food products that you're getting ready to serve to your family? Would you set that um, on the floor? Probably not, especially have pet, pets running around <laughs> like we do here in my home. Um, so again, why, if we're not going to do that at home, why do we do that in our food plants? This is where I was talking about earlier when I opened up this presentation about the, the education. OK, educating our employees, educating the, the employees that storing that edible dough right next to a trash can is probably not the best idea. There's a potential there for contamination. Well, would you say that this is a reason you have reason to believe that that edible dough uh, or that dough that's going to be made into bread or muffins or whatnot could get contaminated? I would. So what are some of the other things we see in this picture? Look at the overheads. OK, and I know the picture is small and I apologize, but the overheads, you see some discoloration and maybe flake and paint over exposed product. What, um, what about the, the scale that off to the left hand side that probably were weighing up trays? Is that scale face? Is that glass or plastic? What about the lights in this picture? Are those lights protected? Do they have a sleeve over the fluorescent lights? So one picture I found as many as eight to nine to ten different violations. And oh, by the way, the one thing that most people focus on, does the employee over off to the right-hand side, does he have a hairnet on? Does he have a beard net on if he has a mustache or a goatee or a beard? Okay. So this is what I'm talking about as far as unsanitary conditions. Now, this is the worst case scenario here, folks, but I want you all to take a good look at 
These are the kind of things that we deal with when we go to plants. And unfortunately, I will tell you, some of these, the, some of these conditions are what we call industry practice. It's very common to find um, some of these conditions. Now, there are some conditions in this plant that are probably not kosher. They're probably not uh, up to par. But there's a lot of other things in this picture that um, we definitely need to improve on, and that could lead to a food safety issue, okay? So how do we build a successful sanitation program? So we've talked about quite a few things so far. We talked about, you know, 402A3 and 402A4, which is the regulations. I've mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned GMPs, which means it stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. And this is what we do every single day in a food plants. But you know what's interesting is I one of the things that I love to do is what I'm doing right now. I love teaching. I love training. Um, in fact, I, I, I was teaching for the last three weeks in San Francisco, Southern California and Northern California earlier this week in Pennsylvania. And I love being able to teach and educate the industry on what we're supposed to be doing, because it's something that we're lacking as far as the education, explaining to them the why. So you all, all of you in this call, and we have <laughs> quite a few people in this call, all of you do a really, really good job of training, but we have an opportunity to get better on educating employees, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do to educate our employees on why um, we have to maintain our facility clean. So are you educating them on what is the most critical cleaning you do? And do you know why you're cleaning? What I'm talking about there is yeah, you think, okay, we're cleaning to make sure and remove any debris or any uh, excess debris or, or, you know, maybe contaminants away from the product. Really, are you not educating them on uh, the fact that if they don't clean, we have the potential for mold to develop and grow? Um, mm -hmm. If it's a milled product, such as flour and corn, are you educating them, them to know that if we don't clean properly and in a, a certain time frame, that insects could develop? We could have insects that the eggs are already in some of the raw materials. Now, some of you in this class, I know when I teach a class of just 10 or 20 people, sometimes there's four or five that have that, that strange look on their face when I tell them that. So I know that there's some people on this call that didn't know that their insect eggs, in some cases, are already in some of the raw materials. So what does that mean? Well, if we don't properly clean, we allow those eggs to hatch, and that's where you get the infestations, okay? Are you clean? Are your cleaning priorities established? So do you know what areas of the plant and equipment and food contact surface have to be cleaned every single day or have to be cleaned every single week? Now, I worked in two different industries. One was the snack food and one was the baking industry. And one of them, we could clean on a weekly basis. So we could literally start up on Monday morning and work all week long. And then on Friday, we would shut down and clean all day Saturday and all day Sunday. The other facility, which was the baking industry, we couldn't do that <clears throat> because we had mold develop. We had insect cycle, life cycles that we were trying to break. Um, and so here's two plants, but with completely different cleaning requirements. OK, and so that's what I'm talking about there. Are, are your cleaning priorities established? Do you know why you're cleaning? Do your sanitarians know why they're cleaning? Do your employees in sanitation understand what they're trying to clean. Is it to try to develop mold and mildew and potential pathogens and microbial conditions? Or are we trying to break those insect cycles? Have you considered each object and area in the needs assessment? And this is another issue that we and my, uh, my, uh, myself and my colleagues at AIB find a lot is they don't include areas that they think is important or they don't understand the importance of some cleaning. Have you conducted a time study to determine amount of time needed to clean? I did some consulting for a bakery in Southern California years ago. And so I went and worked with this company for several days. So I actually literally would, uh, would get there at midnight and watch the entire sanitation. And I was watch, uh, you know, to see how they were cleaning, um, you know, what they were cleaning. But one of the first things that I asked them was, have you, gone, have you all conducted a time study? Do you know how much time is needed to clean that mixer? Do you know how much time is needed to clean those bowls? Do you know how much time is needed to clean those conveyors? And they looked at me with that kind of strange look on their face, and that pretty much answered the question that they had not conducted a time study. They didn't know um, the importance of managing your time. Why is that important? Well, I will tell you, unfortunately, that sanitation is what they call indirect labor. So when, we're, when the plant is down and when you're cleaning the plant, when the plant is down and the maintenance mechanics are working on the equipment, 
and typically maintenance and sanitation are fighting for the same uh, time slots, you're not producing product, which means you're losing money because you're paying all these employees, you're paying 20 or 30 employees to clean and to maintain your equipment, but you're not producing bread, you're not producing the snack food, you're not producing those great products that you make. So typically what a lot of plants do is they try to rush through sanitation to try to get back up to the time frame of what we're producing again. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to know exactly how much time is needed to clean the mixer so that we can use uh, whatever little time we have left to clean the conveyors, to clean the food contact surfaces, all the other areas, the drains of the plant, the overheads, the lights, all the different things that have to be included. Are there any diverse challenges that we have in our facility to clean? Okay, what are we talking about as far as those diverse challenges? Um, Break it, you know, uh, taking equipment apart, getting into the chain guards and breaking those apart and thinking about the uh, safety concerns when we have to do that as well. Um, getting the, the scissor lift or forklifts or, or uh, um, uh, uh, boom lifts to get up to clean the overheads, um, you know, getting into the, uh, you know, pulling off the drain covers, um, you know, pulling off the pieces of equipment to get inside to clean. That's where the accumulation is. So those are some of those diverse challenges we have. Have the employees been trained on how to break those equipment apart? There might be some areas that we don't want our sanitarians to get into because of the safety requirements or the safety challenges. That might have, we might have to get maintenance involved because, you know, they're electrical boxes. Do you really want your employees getting into those to inspect and to clean? And then when you do get into there, how do you clean that? You don't want to introduce water into an electrical panel. That's not going to be a very good uh, situation. There's some very, very serious safety issues there. Okay. So remember, sanitation receives whatever times production can allow or will give them. And that's what I was talking about is that production, that's the cash cow. That's what's paying all of our salaries. That's what's paying all of our bills, even maintenance and sanitation that's working on the weekends when the plant is not running. So typically what happens in a food plant is um, they want to make sure and run as long as they can, as many hours as they can, because that's where they make the money. So those are some of those diverse challenges that we have is you're limited. You only have so much time to clean the plant, to maintain the plant. Are the results of an insufficient cleaning pest related or microbial related? And this is what I was talking about, the education. Um, we have to educate our employees that, you know, when you have water activity, we have moisture, we have some raw materials and ingredients that can sustain pathogens. We have to educate them that that's the reason we're cleaning. Now we have all of this technology available to us, folks. We have ATP, uh, identified triphosphate, that we use to clean. This will tell us that the surface is still dirty. There's still some organic material there. When I first started 38 years ago, the ATP just started. They started with that technology. I would actually have to mix the reagents and the chemicals together, and then I would go out. If I didn't mix those reagents together properly, I would get the wrong results. Now we, and when I say we, I'm including myself with you all, we in the food industry have a lot of technology. They have developed technology, and, and, and Simon earlier put up all of those different sponsors that we have, um, you know, that, uh, that uh, you know, help support uh, us in the food industry. You have, uh, you know, uh, these companies that develop all of these swab testing kits to be able to tell us that, yeah, you clean, but there's still some organic material there. Um, they even have testing for all of the uh, uh, in, in the United States, we have what we call the big nine uh, allergens, okay? In Canada, they're a little bit ahead of us in Canada. They got 11 in Canada. But different parts of the world have a lot of the same allergens, or they may even have more. They even have technology now where you can do a swab test for dairy, for for uh, sesame seed now, with it, which is the newest allergen here in the United States. They have swab tests for peanuts, for tree nuts, for soy. They have swab tests for wheat. Uh, they have a swab test for, for uh, shellfish and, and, and uh, finfish. So all of these different allergens, which is the number one cause for class one recalls here in the United States, they have testing for that. So why is that important? Why am I covering that? The government, the FDA, when they come in to do audits, if you're not using that technology to identify these hazards, um, because there's a cost involved, okay? It's not cheap. There's a cost involved to, to purchasing and buying all of these different materials. Um, they're going to say, are you more concerned about profitability? Are you more concerned about just making money? Or are you not concerned about the, the public health? You're not concerned about the food safety of your products? They're not going to take that very lightly, that we're not using that technology. It's available to all of us now. 
to make sure that we're making a food safe product for our customers, okay? So what should you consider when deciding how often a cleaning task should be performed? So here's some of the things that when I was a sanitarian at the two facilities that I worked at, all of the things that, and I started working from the ground up. I did the work itself. So it's not like they put me in a position and you go manage the sanitation department, but I didn't know what I was doing. I had to clean the equipment. I had to use the, the water like this person in this picture is doing. I had to do time studies. I would have to make sure and check the equipment afterwards. Here's some of the things that I would educate my employees. And now as a consultant, I educate the companies that I go do work for is you have to know what the hazards are that you're trying to control. You need to know how much time you need to properly clean that equipment so it's a sanitary, uh, it's, it's uh, prevented, presented in a sanitary uh, condition to production when they start back up, okay? We have to have a little bit of entomology knowledge. So we have to know a little bit about the insect life cycles. What does that mean? Do you, do you have to be an entomologist? No. Now, I happen to have a license in pest control. I've had it for over 34 years. And I've maintained that because I do a lot of consulting on, on IPM, integrated pest management. And I, and I got that license when I worked in the food industry and I've maintained it over the years. So, so I do have a, a, a probably a little bit better understanding of life cycles. So I understand that stored green insects, such as flower beetles and um, uh, cigarette beetles, uh, you know, whether the red or confused cigarette beetles, um, you know, uh, Indian meal moss and, and some of those store grade insects, they have a certain life cycle, okay? And it's usually four to six weeks in ideal conditions. What does that mean? In your nice, warm, toasty bakery, even though it's winter outside, and it's cold and there's snow, it's nice and warm inside that facility. So you can still have those insects developing underneath that equipment and in those cracks and crevices. So it's important for us to understand what are those insect life cycles, okay? And typically, you're going to set up your cleaning schedules to break those cycles. You're going to set up your cleaning a minimum of you don't want to go past three weeks because the insect cycles are, in some cases, under ideal conditions, four to six weeks. So what that means is if you don't clean a certain area or if you miss an area um, and, and let that go for four weeks, you can start getting these eggs hatching that I was mentioning earlier that's in a lot of raw materials these eggs start hatching and all of a sudden now we have flower beetles in our plant or we have uh, cigarette beetles or Indian mill moths um, or warehouse beetles. Um, why is that important? Does anybody know what the rule is in the United States? And in a lot of other countries, they have rules of having foreign materials such as insects in the products. The rule under section 117.35 states that the plant should be free from pests. It doesn't say whether they're dead or alive. That means if we find any insects in the plant, we're in violation of that rule, of that GMP, okay? Equipment availability. So when is equipment going to be available to us in sanitation to clean, okay? Are we cleaning only because the boss says to? I don't think so. See, that's the way it used to be 38 years ago and, and, and past. Uh, when I first started, there was a lot of things that have changed over the years as far as uh, how we clean and what we do from a cleaning standpoint. And it used to be, we cleaned because the boss says that the plant just didn't look clean enough anymore and we had to clean. Well, that has changed. Now we have regulations that we have to follow. And now it's not just because the boss says, it doesn't matter if the boss wants to clean or not, we have regulations we have to comply with. Are we cleaning when customer complaints dictate a need or change? Well, let me tell you folks, if you're cleaning because you're getting customer complaints in and you have issues with the product, it's too late. If the products have already gone out, and it's contaminated or adulterated, um, it's, it's too late. We're going to lose those customers, and we have regulatory issues that we're going to have to deal with because then we might get a visit from the FDA uh, and us having to explain why we had that foreign material in the products, why it had mold in the product, why there was a pathogen such as salmonella or listeria or E. coli <clears throat> in the product. So how do we build a successful sanitation program? We have to change the culture, folks. Ironically, and this is something that every one of us in this call had to deal with uh, several years ago, COVID um, had a rippling effect. COVID changed a lot of things uh, globally. Um, and ironically, even when COVID was going on for those two or three years, um, the FDA was even down. The FDA was not going and doing these audits um, the, uh, routine audits. They would only go to these food plants when there was a significant complaint or issue. Well, when they were down, they had a chance to go back into HACCP and make some changes to the HACCP program. 
one of the things that they added to HACCP was you have to develop a culture. You have to make sure that you have a positive food safety culture. So what I'm talking about there is sanitation programs and sustaining a good sanitation program is not cheap. In fact, it's very expensive. And this is why some plants try to cut corners sometimes. Or if they're going to have to cut, if you're trying to maintain your budget and you're having to cut corners, typically it's going to be sanitation that's going to get cut. But do you think that the plant is going to say, well, we need to shut down the third shift or we need to stop producing this product? No. They're going to say, we need to take those hours that we're using for sanitation and use those to produce, produce uh, uh, you know, uh, more food products. That is the culture that we have to change in the food industry. And I'm not talking just about in the United States. I'm talking globally, okay? Why do we fail? Well, remember I mentioned that uh, sanitation is what they call indirect labor. So sanitation uh, and maintenance, um, when the plant is down, that's when we're cleaning the plant. You can't clean a piece of equipment when you're running production on it, okay? So we have to wait until the plant is down to clean this equipment. So that is indirect labor. We're, we're having to pay these employees, yet we're not producing the great food products that you all produce. That means we're losing money. So let's try to save uh, those, lay, those hours and let's try to cut those hours as minimum as we can so that we can get back and start producing and making money again. So indirect labor. While lines are down, the plant is not producing. So we are losing or we're not making money. Training new sanitation employees correctly is also expensive. Um, typically, you think, oh, anybody can clean. I mean, I, you know, we clean at home. We wash dishes at home. So we can just hire anybody and throw them out there and they can clean. That used to be the mindset, folks. I can tell you that was the mindset. It's not anymore. It is a, a, it is a very uh, uh, unique position. It is a, a uh, I, I see uh, they're looking for experienced sanitarians um, all the time, some of these companies. Um, so it is a very uh, uh, unique position anymore. It's not just you throw anybody in there. How can we be more effective in our food plants? We have to uh, evaluate our resources, okay? We have to determine which departments and staff are responsible for individual cleaning tasks. How can we be more effective, okay? Educate the staff and not just train them. This is what I mentioned when I started, is we're just training employees. We're not educating them. We have to educate them on the why. Everyone has been trained, but have they been educated? Do they understand that if we don't break those cycles, we have insects that can develop? Do they understand that if we don't clean where we have that uh, product that has, uh, uh, you know, at least 0.85 water activity or moisture, that we can have pathogens that can develop? Um, that can lead to salmonella or listeria or, 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 or other issues. We have to be creative in scheduling with production and maintenance. Typically, when the plant is down, maintenance and sanitation is fighting for those, lab, for those time slots. I used to, I had a really good rapport with maintenance department, and we had to work hand in hand together because we knew there was only so many hours that we had. So we had to work side by side, us cleaning and them maintaining and doing the PMs on the equipment. We have to evaluate the resources, uh, resource requirements that we have. We have to determine which departments and staff are responsible for individual cleaning tasks. Everybody seems to think that anything that's dirty in the plant is the responsibility of, of sanitation. That is not the case. In some cases, we have production that has a big responsibility in making sure and preparing and leaving that equipment clean, uh, somewhat clean, or at least housekeeping, so that we can get in and use those few labor hours that we have to clean it properly. And we have to have management support to be effective. So kind of in closing this, uh, kind of going uh, to some of the last uh, few items that, uh, you know, are important in developing those uh, good solid sanitation programs. I mentioned earlier, folks, there we have the technology out there. Um, we have to utilize technology and resources available to us. If you are having customer complaints for allergen uh, uh, issues, if you're having customer complaints for uh, an undeclared ingredient, um, for pathogen issues, why are we not using ATP testing? Why are we not using the allergen test kits that will tell us that the equipment that your employees thought they cleaned good still had residues on there? And now you made a different product that did not contain that allergen. And now you have a class one recall situation on your hand. ATP testing is a great way to validate if cleaning was effective. And you have an advantage, folks. Um, I didn't have this advantage when I started 38 years ago. Um, we just started with that technology. 
it has gotten so much better over the years. You know, looking at some of those sponsors that were that uh, uh, Simon put up earlier, you know, the metal detection and the x-rays and some of the cleaning technologies and the testing that we have. You have all of these resources available to us. Why aren't we using it? Uh, these are great tools um, to, to let you know that the, the work that you thought was really good, they missed a spot. They missed some areas. There's still some allergens there. There's still some residue there that's going to lead to a, a contamination issue or a customer complaint. There's some issues, uh, some residue there that's going to lead to microbial growth. Okay. We have to uh, begin using training resources offered to you from vendors. Um, you know, I used to use, uh, when I would purchase all the chemicals and the equipment, I had these chemical vendors that would, uh, part of the service was they could, they would come in and train my employees on the chemicals. They would train on how the chemicals work. Um, I often ask in my classes, does everybody know why you use hot water to wash your hands? And everybody tells me the same thing. In fact, I, I did it again this week and I did it last week when I was in San Francisco and I asked the employees, and they said, yes, the hot water to wash our hands kills bacteria. I said, do you understand and know how hot you have to have that water to kill bacteria on your hands if you do have bacteria on your hands? No. The reason we use hot water, folks, is to allow the chemicals to work more effectively, to break down the solids and to get the, to the oils that we have on our hands. And then it allows that E2 rated soap that we're using that does work on microbial activity to work better. And so when you're training your employees, folks, I, I challenge you, make sure you let them know. The hot water we're washing our hands with is not to kill bacteria. It's to allow the chemicals and the soaps to work more effectively. And in a food plant, when we're using hot water, it allows that, that sodium hydroxide and that caustic work more effectively. You don't have to have hot water for all chemicals, but you utilize those, those resources of chemical vendors that will offer that service up to you if you're purchasing their chemicals. Educate, educate, educate. We have to educate our employees, folks. Um, you know, like I said, and I can't, I can't stress it enough. All of you do a phenomenal job. You know, and I'm looking at all the list here of the folks and Edwin over from Tanzania and 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 Ruchi in, in in Vancouver and Marcy in Ontario and all these different places. Mike over in Iowa. You guys do a phenomenal job of training, but we have a big opportunity to get better on educating our employees, educating on why we're doing those things. Okay. The only way people really understand the importance of what they are doing is if they know what can occur if they do not execute and comply properly. OK, so I challenge you all, um, educate your employees, continue training, continue doing the great job of training. But let's take it a little further and let's start educating our employees so they understand why they're doing that thing. You know, they have to comply with the GMPs, why they're washing the, the, the equipment, why they're using certain chemicals, how those chemicals work. This is what most customers, what most consumers think our food plants look like. This is an actual picture, just like the one earlier I put up was an actual picture. This is what they think our food plants look like. This is what the plants should look like. I mean, look at the conditions in this plant. This is an actual condition of a bakery in um, the Far East. Do you want to work in this plant or do you want to work in that other plant? Do you want to buy food products from that other bakery or from this bakery? Okay. This is what we want to make sure our, our customers know that our facilities, uh, are, are, are the food products that we're producing, um, are being produced in a plant that hopefully looks like this. So now uh, I'd like to uh, open it up. Um, I uh, set my clock here to make sure and give a little bit of time for a little bit of Q&A um, as far as... Um, yeah. Okay, great. That was really great. Um, lots of fantastic information, but the imagery as well was excellent. Uh, so let's try and um, can you hear me, by the way? Uh, yes, I can, can hear you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, good. Yeah, uh, it's been breaking up a bit, but I think it's on my end. So okay. well, let's try. Uh, from Lisa, I'm looking for GMPs cleaning and sanitizing for glass jars used to package food products. I've met with some resistance from upper management motivated by their concerns to minimize costs and reduce risk of glass breakage. So I don't know if that's a comment or a question, really, uh, but that's. Probably typical, as you said, obviously, because time's money. 
Yes, and I'm looking at that, Miss um, Lisa, and you know, this is a big concern, and this is uh, you know, something that concerns facilities that are dealing with glass containers. And you know, you always have to be concerned about you know the 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 the, the fraying or the the you know uh, in cleaning of those glass containers, making sure we don't damage those. Um, there are some some uh, there's some technology out there to monitor. In fact, I did some facilities that have some systems to monitor. It's almost like x-ray looking at that. There's very, very pricey. Um, the other thing is uh, going back to what I talked about, Lisa, in training and educating. And the other thing is monitoring systems that can monitor to identify if we have some glass that is damaged and just using the good gen uh, GMPs and good manufacturing practices on proper handling of glass so that we don't um, damage that glass and have potential contamination. There's a lot of glass containers out there, so people are doing it now. So they've got you got to know that somebody's doing it out there and they're doing it uh, uh, where they're not introducing glass into the products. So good question. Thank you. Okay, uh, I've got a question here from uh, Shelley. Do you consider ATP swabbing as part of an environmental monitoring program? We have been seeing many GFSI auditors not consider ATP swabbing to be part of environmental monitoring program. Um, I, I would actually, uh, sometimes this depends, uh, Ms. Shelley, great question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, it depends on the audit you get. Um, if they have an understanding of microbiological uh, you know, contamination, they understand that ATP can assist you. It can tell you that you still have some organic material there. Now, what, what some of those auditors are probably, the issue they have with ATP is it's not going to tell you, uh, Shelly, it's not going to tell you if you have listeria. It's not going to tell you if you have a salmonella or E. coli. Um, it just will tell you that you have some organic material there. So can it be used as a tool? Absolutely. I have a lot of plants that use it. But I do understand where those auditors are saying, this is not telling you what's there. You would have to specifically test for those pathogens, but it can be used as part of an environmental monitoring program. I have many facilities that use that. Okay, question from Kathy. Is there an effective dry clean method to ensure equipment is clean? Um, you know, kind of the same. Thank you, Kathy, for that question. And yes, uh, you can still use, uh, usually in a, in a dry operation, such as a flour mill or areas that you can't introduce water, um, that's an issue. But uh, the ATP testing can help you. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, also testing of the products, testing, uh, you know, uh, residue testing um, to see and sending it out to a lab to see if you have any um, concerns. But the, my question for you, Kathy, is, what are we concerned about? What are we looking for? Are there, are there specific pathogens you're concerned about? Um, uh, are you just wanting to make sure that the surface is clean? If you want to make sure the surface is just clean, that's where the ATP can help you. If you want to know about a specific pathogen, that's where maybe some specific pathogen testing um, and then sending it out and having it properly analyzed um, uh, has to be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Raphael, excellent presentation. What is the full meaning of ATP? What is the mechanism of action? What swab test is available for peanut residue? Very good question, Rafael. Um, and this is what I like in the classes is challenging me, but it stands for adenosine triphosphate. And it's, a, uh, um, yeah, I had to do a lot of study in there, so I went to get all that information. But what it does is <laughs> it's technology that what it does is it's reading light units. So, so um, you know, you, you test or swab the surface and then you, you have a certain equipment that is going to read that and it's reading the light units in that specific material that you're testing. So it doesn't test and tell you if you have a pathogen, it just tells you that there's still something present there. Now, as far as the swab test for peanut residue, um, uh, Neogen, uh, Neogen actually uh, has, I think, every kind of test for all of the uh, allergens, including peanut. And what they're testing for is they're testing for the specific uh, protein. So you're testing for the peanut residue, the peanut protein. You're testing for soy uh, protein. You're testing for a dairy protein. So that is what you're testing for is they're testing for the specific protein of peanuts. And if it comes out positive, that means you still have peanut residue. And that means you ha potentially have a contamination issue, um, which is an allergen and is a significant issue. So. Okay. Uh, question from Alu Coyote. How do you set targets of cleaning time to daily planning schedule? Um, great question there. Um, and, you know, you have to you have to work with production and you have to sometimes 
um, you know, understand you have to clean the equipment and then figure out how long it takes. And you're constantly trying to cut that time down from cleaning. So you have to clean it and see if there's new technology to be able to clean it faster. But once you know how long it takes to clean that equipment, you have to make sure that that time is allotted for cleaning. And you have to make sure that production understands it doesn't matter how much product we make. If it's not a clean product, it's not sanitary. Um, and if it's not adulterated, it doesn't make any, uh, you know, it doesn't help us anyway. So you have to make sure that you do time studies to understand how much time is needed to clean the certain mixers and conveyors and other pieces of equipment. So the time studies is very important, which I covered. Yeah, he did. A question from Mohammed: uh, Is ATP verification or validation? <laughs> um, ATP is more a. Uh, uh, it could be. It could be one of both. It depends on what you're doing. Okay, but it could be a validation that the equipment is clean. It could be a verification of a cleaning that was done as far as you know so it's kind of depending on what you're using it for it could be part of a verification and validation um of of uh, of cleaning that you're doing um you know is because again what it's telling you is that you still have some organic material there uh it doesn't tell you what it is but that could be invaluable information because you know you're still not done you still have to clean it okay so yeah okay Getting quite, as you would expect, specific questions to their own, uh, you know, processes and food product types, etc. One from Rosa, what type of cleaning would you recommend for a food storage and distribution facility? No production or exposed food. Great question, Miss Rosa. And, you know, what's interesting is um, that that's exactly what I did earlier this week in Philadelphia. I was working with a distribution center. And they didn't score very well because the auditor found some issues in the plant. Um, it's actually an advantage in a distribution center where you have where you don't have any exposed product. A lot of the house, the cleaning in that is going to be more surface cleaning, uh, you know, housekeeping cleaning. But you still have if you have spills, um, if it's allergen or whatnot, if it's flower products, you could have insects developing from that. Um, but you actually have a more of an advantage in a distribution center where no products are exposed because. Um, um, it's a little bit uh, less stringent than in a food plant where you have the food is coming in contact with the surfaces. Okay, uh, another wide ranging question. <laughs> Ruchi, how to develop the culture without much management support? <laughs> well, I can tell you, uh, Ruchi, and you know what? There's probably you're probably not the only one on this call that has the same question. So this is probably for. If there's a 1,500, there might be a 1,000 of you that have this same concern. You have to have management support, Ruchi. It is imperative. And, and when I go into plants that don't score well, it's typically because they're more concerned about just production and production and, produ and producing. Um, it starts with management support. So if you have a good, solid culture, it's typically when you have good, solid management support. So thank you very much for that question, Ruchi. Okay, uh, question from Dawn. Uh, are time studies a good way to validate existing SSOPs? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the very first thing I asked this, this bakery in, in Southern California was, have you, got, have you done time studies yet? And they kind of looked at me with that strange look. And that's when I knew that they, why they were having some of those, some of those problems, okay? Um, but yes, time studies are a very good way to validate existing SSOPs, and it allows you to make changes, less time for cleaning, because um, you know now you've got a different way of cleaning, and now you can use that little bit of time to clean something else. So uh, uh, that's why I put this in the presentation, is, and it's one of the first things I did, is that, um, you know, how much, how are you gonna clean if you don't know how long it takes to clean? Exactly. Uh, question from Amon, how can we audit the sanitation procedures? Well, this is, uh, and this is, uh, you know, I do this every day for a living. I go out and I evaluate and I look at, um, uh, you know, if the plants were properly cleaning. I'm not there while they're cleaning, so I have to evaluate the, uh, you know, the conditions. Um, but typically taking a procedure and sometimes just going out there and watching sanitation and seeing how they're cleaning, seeing if they're doing things and, and losing a, a, a valuable time. Um, you know, seeing if the people are trained and educated. That's the other big topic that I harped on several times in the presentation is, is uh, you know, making sure they're trained and educated um, to follow those cleaning procedures. And that's going to result in us having cleaner equipment and less issues and even customer complaints if our SSOPs are well written and they're being followed. 
Okay. Um, question from Roberto. How can we balance resources for cleaning and for reducing sources and causes of dirt? Um, again, um, there's a... How can we balance resources for cleaning and regen? Well, the thing is, again, you have to understand what you're cleaning. And in and, and, and one of the slides I put on there, what are we cleaning? Is it, does it have, uh, um, you know, uh, moisture? Is there moisture associated with it? Is, is it products that can, can sustain pathogen growth? Is it a dry cleaning? Um, and so those, those are all questions. When I go into plant now after 28 years, it's really easy to go in any plant. And I pretty much know what the issues and the risks are. But the way you can balance your resources is you have to understand what you're cleaning. You have to understand what's going to happen if we don't clean. Are we going to have pathogen issues? Are we going to have um, uh, in insect development? Um, is this going to lead to customer complaints? Or is this just going to be quality issues? Okay. Okay. There's more questions coming in than we can actually ask. <laughs> They're quicker. <laughs> They're coming in quicker than you're answering them, actually. Uh, Ronnie, where can you find a good sanitation training for dry cleaning course? Um, you know, Ronnie, we have some information. Um, and um, you see there the, the, at the uh, website there and, and uh, um, where you can reach out to IB. And we have some, some information materials. There's also some... Um, uh, companies that um, have some general cleaning programs that you can utilize as a base point, starting point, and then spin off from there. Um, but sometimes companies that are selling um, uh, cleaning equipment, um, chemical companies uh, sometimes have some good information on, on cleaning. Of course, they want chemicals to be used, but um, uh, there's there are some good uh, resources out there. Um, uh, typically, uh, uh, manufacturers and people that are in that service will have some good information on how to properly clean and dry clean. Okay, a question from Huda. Uh, hello, thank you for sharing your expertise. I work in a probiotic factory where bacteria are produced according, according to you. How can we set up an effective cleaning system? Well, this is interesting. And, and you know, we've, we visit a lot of different facilities and, and this is kind of a unique one. So you have to make sure because um, the thing is, is that this could definitely affect those pro those products um, as far as if there's any residues left. So this is where the uh, the specific testing is going to come in play. Um, and who's it? so the cleaning system is you have to understand what are the impacts to your probiotic products that you're producing? What can negatively impact that? And you have to put up programs, whether they're specific chemicals, testing, there's specific testing to make sure that we know where cleaning those surfaces. And the other thing is, again, um, education and training, training those employees to understand those very specifics of the cleaning for your probiotics. Okay, thanks. Yes, see, uh, Roland, how do you motivate sanitation staff to do ATP swabbing regularly? Or for the procedures, etc. Good question, Roland. How do you motivate them? Well, you know that that monthly, that weekly check they get should be motivation enough. Um, but no, uh, you know it, it goes back to education, Roland. Um, that, a great question. You know you have to educate them and say, explain to them that the ATP is is telling us something. The ATP is telling us that we missed a spot. The ATP is explaining and use examples. I use a lot of examples. I, I use props when I do the cleaning. So uh, that way they can get the picture of it, okay? But that's really, uh, you know, the way you can motivate them is, is, is do the education, the why, not just training, but the why behind the importance of ATP and how that can help you in your sanitation program. Okay. Uh, it's Cleaning, this is from Mohammed, is cleaning validation necessary for food processing equipment? Uh, yes. Um, you know, sometimes it's from a regulatory standpoint, sometimes from a customer standpoint. Um, but if you're not doing validation cleaning, how do you know that the equipment was clean? How do we know that we don't have any pathogens still present? How do we know that we don't have any allergens present? Uh, which could lead to a class one recall, to customer complaints, to losing customers. Um, so is, that, is, is cleaning validation necessary? Absolutely. It's part of the regulations. It's law. <laughs> okay. And uh, there are a couple of questions that are sort of similar. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Nandish 
kindly inform about the intervals and contact time for sanitation of equipment and food handlers. And somebody else has asked about how do you set the parameters, et cetera, for, you know, for uh, different things. So, yeah, and, 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 this one for yes, and I'm trying to kind of go read between here as far as some of the specifics. Sometimes, and, and I hope I can answer your question, but, uh, but when you talk about contact time for sanitation, I'm assuming you're talking about sometimes there's chemicals that are used. And what we're talking about is that chemical has to have the right amount of time to work on those pathogens maybe that we're trying to control, those, those contaminants, okay? Um, and that is the information that you can get from our, some, and sometimes our chemical providers uh, chemical companies have the science behind that. There are some chemicals that have to have that contact time long enough to kill that bacteria. Even some of the chemicals that you have at home under your sink or in the pan, uh, you know, to cleaning it. If you read that label, it talks about, you know, it kills 99.9% of the, you know, uh, you know, even COVID. It, it, there's a, it talks about COVID on some of those containers um, and some of the other uh, uh, contaminants that we're trying to clean. So read the label. The information, they've done the science on that. There are different contact times uh, for some chemicals. So be able to get and, and work on those uh, surface uh, surfaces that we're trying to clean and sanitize. Okay, Esperanza's asking a question. Uh, what GFSI's acceptable sanitation program for freezer? It won't be GFSI, but you know, in, in standards what's the standard uh yes for a freeze yeah yes hope i will answer your question uh, miss esperanza um so what gfsi acceptable sanitation program for freezer um you know really what does your procedure say because when a good uh, a global food safety initiative uh, requirements whether it's sqf brc fss 22k um, you know, they're going to look at what your procedure is and they're going to audit to see if you're following your procedures for, for a freezer. Well, what are some of the conditions? What are we trying to clean in a freezer? Some of the ice built up. If we have some warm air going in there, some of that accumulation uh, of the ice built up, you're not going to probably get any microbial concerns in, in a freezer um, because some of those uh, pathogens um, are, are, are temperature sensitive. OK, it's not that they can't survive. Listeria can survive in freezing conditions. OK. Um, um, but uh, typically the GFSI acceptable sanitation program is what your pro is your program controlling the potential hazards that exist in your freezer or in your facility. Okay. Uh, we're about 10 minutes over. You're still okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> You're doing I great. love this. I, mean, <laughs> I told you You're I'm doing great, you, Jesse. <laughs> uh, Elaine, uh, which dry cleaning method is the best? What about fishing with organic acids in pet food factory? <laughs> and I'm not sure if maybe that's a type wow. of, if it's flushing with organic acids, maybe. Um, but dry cleaning methods uh, is the best. Um, well, it depends because the thing is, uh, uh, and I want to say, is it Elaine? Um, you have to be careful because like if you have like a, a like a flour mill or a sugar mill, a sugar refinery, you have to be careful with dust explosion. So there's some equipment that you can't use that can, if it creates a spark, but vacuuming um, is, is a good way of dry cleaning. Um, one thing I will tell you, don't grab an air hose and just start blowing and stuff because all you're doing is blowing that stuff all over the place. And, and there's a little misconception about using an air hose for cleaning. We don't like to see that and that can create a lot of other issues, but um, some cases, uh, vacuuming is a good way to get rid of uh, dry residues. Um, and then a flushing agent uh, um, depends on what kind of acid you're using. I used to use phosphoric and nitric acid be, uh, for certain buildup. Um, so it depends on the acid that you're talking about. And what are you trying to control? What's, what's the surface that you're trying to clean? Some acids are very, well, obviously acids will eat some metals and soft metals. So you have to be careful um, about uh, uh, using some uh, acids in uh, on equipment. Okay, a couple of questions uh, about documentation. Oh, light. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, there you uh, go, Jeff. What document? What documentation do you like to see for daily sanitation? Typically, the daily sanitation is going to be the housekeeping. And daily sanitation, unless it's a facility that has to go down. For instance, in the meat uh, uh, industry, they have to they have to go down and clean. They can only go two two shifts and they have to clean because there's already microbes present. So they by law, they can't go for a whole week. Um, for So for daily, depending on the operation and the type of industry, 
the day-to-day cleaning is the general housekeeping, okay? Unless you're going down every single day to clean and you're sanitizing the equipment, if it's a micro-sensitive product, then I'm expecting to see the chemical usage and, and the cleaning and then maybe maybe ATP to follow up with that to see if it was properly cleaned. You might even have testing uh, of the surfaces. Some plants will do uh, testing of surfaces of not zone one, because as you know, zone one is, is if you use a swab of zone one, it comes out positive. That means anything that comes in contact with that, let's, such as a food contact surface, is probably adulterated or contaminated. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mana Mohan is asking, can we have a session on master sanitation plant template development? How about next year? We Is that something we could look at? Uh, maybe for another sure. webinar? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Obviously, it's a very popular topic, and in, in terms of popular, meaning people. Looks like we might have to do this, this again, Simon. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Joe, what are your feelings on PBS cleaning? I have no Joel, idea what you, PBS cleaning is. And, and I'm not sure. There's so many acronyms out there. So, Joel, I'm not sure if you can break that down. What is the PBS cleaning? And then I might be able to answer that question uh, if you would uh, repost that, because I'm not sure I've heard that term. Uh... Okay. Krista, with dry cleaning, do you still have to have a sanitizing step? Um, typically, if it's if it's dry cleaning, dry cleaning typically is just moving uh, solids and, and, and materials. Um, um, if it's dry, again, the thing is, is uh, anytime you introduce moisture, you have a potential for pathogens. So typically in a dry cleaning, um, uh, you don't have a sanitation step because you haven't introduced moisture or water. So the potential there for the pathogens is a lot less. Okay, question from Kathy. Uh, what's the best ATP meter to use for checking areas are clean? What is an effective range to set with ATP results? Miss um, Kathy, sometimes the manufacturer of the ATP equipment, um, there's System Sure, there's Lightning, those are different manufacturers of it. They will have their own set of um, readings. And then you will use that and, and do the testing. You will set your range of what you want, what's what's acceptable for you. Um, you know, some of them, they have a lower ratings as far as, you know, if it's, uh, you know, one to five, that means, uh, you know, we have to reclean it. Some of them, you know, you're never going to really get down to zero, but you have to check with the manufacturer of the equipment that you're using. They will have the recommended ranges and then you base, uh, you know, your clean uh, on those ranges and, and uh, if you can meet those or not. So you can't, it's hard to say you just set the okay, range. Okay, Selvin. So. Yeah. Okay, no, that's clear. Selvin, what cleaning methods do you suggest for cannabis processing facility against mold? You know, what's interesting, uh, Selvin, is that, uh, you know, this is a new industry coming out, and I've had some people in some of my courses from the cannabis industry, and, and I have yet to go to one of those plants. But you have to think about cannabis. You have to think about other uh, uh, materials such as, as cannabis, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like the, in the produce industry. And it's the same, it's the same thing. It's, it's a plant based product, um, obviously. And, and, uh, um, so it's going to be some of the same, um, technology and cleaning for other products such as that are, are plant based. Um, you know, so you look at, you know, lettuce and cabbage and other products that are plants. And obviously this is used for a whole different, uh, different, uh, uh usage. Um, but I would look at other products that are similar to cannabis, okay, and look at what cleaning that they're using, um, and and uh, it probably would be effective also for 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 the growth of mold. Okay, uh, Joe's come back uh, saying performance based in the okay. poultry industry using chlor chlorine chlorine only. Okay. Yeah, see, they have very unique uh, in the meat and poultry uh, uh, industry as far as USDA. Um, there's some chemicals that can be used, um, and there's some that are recommended. In fact, there's some that it's pretty much across the board that are used for the cleaning of poultry. So what, what are we controlling there? Where the biggest concern there is for salmonella. And so what you have to do is, is try to find the chemicals that are recommended for that have the best uh, results for the growth of salmonella or for the control of salmonella. Um, and and, uh, and any chemical company, um, you know, would have that information. 
um, and and uh, to be able to get that information as far as what are the chemicals that are going to be more effective for you in controlling if it's poultry, it's going to be salmonella. What you're concerned about? Okay. By by the way, we've we've got a few more questions left. We'll try and get through them. But if you yeah. need to get away, obviously it's recorded. This and um, we'll be following mm -hmm. up with the slides and recording later. Uh, Guilia, is there a checklist to work from for dry and wet cleaning? You know what? Typically, uh, Julia, um, you develop your own checklist um, and then you follow that and you modify and change that as necessary. The regulatory agencies come in and audit you against your checklist and against what you developed. The FDA is not going to develop a checklist. AIB is not going to develop a checklist. We have assisted plants in working on that. The FDA will not. But AIB as a consulting agency will work with you on that. But there's really not a checklist out there. This is the, every plan is different. And so you have to develop your checklist for both dry and wet cleaning and then see if that is efficient and sufficient for you. And that is going to be changed constantly, though, because, uh, you know, if you have issues and customer complaints, you may have to go back to the drawing board and make changes to that checklist. Um, Gabriel. Any suggestions to do an air ambient test in a bakery? Um, yes, Gabriel, thank you for that question. Um, there are plate, uh, you know, sample, sample, you know, plate uh, testing, air plate uh, testing that's done. Um, any kind of, uh, there's, there's uh, labs out there you can get that information from, uh, you know, the testing kits that they can provide for air uh, handling testing or air plate testing. If you have a product, if you produce a product, that is exposed to the environment after the kill step, you do not have a choice, folks. In the United States, let me rephrase that. In the United States with FSMA, um, if you produce a food product that is exposed to the environment after the kill step, you have to have an environmental monitoring program. And so um, because that's a law, there's companies out there that have those that technology. Um, I do plants all the time that's doing air plate testing and air handling testing, um, environmental testing. So. Okay, uh, Michael, bacteria, microbes, pathogens of concern in dry, clean only coffee roasting facility. Um, and also, you know, Michael did ask how, effect, how effective is ATP testing surfaces in coffee roasting facilities? So, two questions. Yeah, ATP, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, I actually have a couple of uh, roasting facilities. And, um, um, you know, uh, a lot of times due to the process, you're, you're you're really not concerned about pathogens because of the temperature that you're roasting those uh, those coffee beans on, um, you know. And then they do a lot of both. They do both uh, mostly dry cleaning there, but um, you know. And I think you asked a question about ATP. It can be very effective. Again, if if you're looking for a specific pathogen, Michael, you're not going to find it with ATP. It's not going to tell you. That's where you have to do the specific testing for those pathogens. But ATP can definitely tell you if you have organic material and, you know, some plants will do, um, you know, uh, uh, TPC, total plate count, yeast and mold and coliform testing. What that has done is that's telling you that the conditions for a pathogen is ripe. The conditions are there. So you know that you have to clean because you can get Listeria salmonella or E. coli or some of the other pathogens because, you know, by testing for total plate count, yeast and molds, coliforms, those are indicators. Okay. So a lot of plants will do that instead of actually specifically testing for specific pathogens. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Uh, Francesco, what about listeria on surfaces far from surface in food contact? How can I eliminate listeria after a positive swab? <laughs> well, you know, you have to do the mapping. Um, you know, when, you, when you're testing for listeria, um, you know, and, and fortunately, I'm glad it's far away from the product zone. Uh, first of all, that's remember earlier um, why I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, talk about not swabbing zone one. Um, uh, you know, uh, you have to uh, you have to clean, re-clean, then you have to test. Then you have to get, I believe the, the requirement is you have to have three negative tests before you know that you've eliminated that listeria, um, or at least you feel comfortable knowing that you've controlled that pathogen. Um, but again, you have to do the mapping and try to find the source. You have to find where that listeria is coming from. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, doing, and, and even if you're constantly getting negative tests, you have to do the uh, vectoring. You have to kind of continually move that to try to find and make sure that you're not only testing in the same spot all the time because it's going to, uh, you know, we, we don't want to get that self, uh, uh, that uh, the 
com confidence level thinking we don't have any pathogens in the plant. You have it in your plant. Trust me, folks. I've done this for a long time. If you look hard enough, you will find it. Okay. Okay. Ashok, is there any testing method to ensure H2O2 traces from UHT aseptic packaging material? And I'm not sure on that H2O2 traces. Um, yeah, so I actually have done some UHT, uh, which is ultra high temperature, uh, uh, you know, process. Um, and again, um, there's, you know, you got moisture testing. Okay. So yeah, there's, there's testing out there. And a lot of these labs that do testing, you may want to reach out to an accredited lab and, 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 and run that by them. And they will have, in some cases, test kits that you can do that testing in aseptic, which again, it's a reason why you're doing the ultra high temperature, um, you know, uh, uh, process. Uh, very, very important uh, as far as, the, you know, eliminating the moisture and whatnot that could lead to uh, a microbial growth. Okay, Gustavo, how frequently should you check chemical strength? Um, anytime, to be honest with you, um, if you, like I did it for many years and I pretty much knew, um, you know, my chemicals that I was using, uh, but if you're doing uh, neutralization, um, you know, if I would uh, clean a, a piece of equipment that I had to neutralize it with an acid, for instance, if I was using a sodium hydroxide or a caustic, I would have to neutralize that. I would have to check the chemical strength and, and the residues. Um, uh, but typically, um, it's not something you do on a regular basis. If you're getting the same chemicals, it hasn't changed. Once you do that initial testing, um, uh, unless the, the chemical manufacturer changes the recipe or changes the chemical, uh, chemicals themselves, uh, they usually don't change much. Um, okay. Nearly there. Nandish to identify the microflora in industry. Can we use swab test internal? to verify the sanitation um you can um i mean obviously if you want to find out the specific uh, uh pathogens you want to test for the specific pathogens of concern uh nandish um but yeah swab test is how we're doing that but there's indicators that we can test to see if if the conditions are are, are are ripe for those micros, or if you want to find a specific micro, you can test for listeria, you can test for salmonella, you can test for E. coli. The problem and the reason some plants don't test specifically for those pathogens is if you test for listeria in your plant and it comes out positive, you know you have listeria in your plant. If you test for salmonella uh, uh, you know, in equipment and it comes out positive, you know you have salmonella, then you have a requirement and you have a responsibility to go through and, and do the corrective action to eliminate and control that. And in some cases, even report that to the regulatory agency. Yeah, got you. Uh, Cara, I have also seen the run to make money mentality. Is there a best practice <laughs> or method for showing the return on investment and importance of cleaning? Oh, yes, there is, Karen. And, I, and, and this is the big concern I see across the board in, in the industry. Now, I will tell you, Kara, that that has changed. In, the, in 38 years I've been in the industry, when I first started, it was run, 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 make money, make money. If we have time to clean, we'll clean. If we don't, we, we're just going to continue to run. That has changed over the last 38 years, at least that I've been in there. Um, but use the examples. Use to go to the FDA website and pull up the class one recalls and try to find a product that's similar to yours and then show the upper management. See, this is exact same product we make. This is a class one recall. It's going to cost us a lot more if we have this type of an issue uh, compared to if we do the right thing. So sometimes you have to use the the, the you know the the, the fear of, of legality uh, you know to put into these folks um, um, uh, to so for them to get the understanding and understand how important cleaning and sanitation is. Um, Subin, any chemical that are manufactured for cleaning are those food grade for food industry. Um, so it, I'm trying to pick the question out like, does he mean that do they all have to be food grade um, cleaning chemicals? Yes, and and, uh, and hopefully this answers your question, Subin, but um, any chemicals that's used in a food manufacturer has to be food grade, okay? Now, I'm not saying that just because it's food grade, it, we can leave residues and it's not gonna be a contamination issue. Um, even if it's a food grade chemical and if we have residues on a piece of equipment and that comes in contact with the food, that's adulteration. Just like with food grade grease, people think that because it's food grade grease, if it comes in contact with the food product that it's okay. No, it is not. It's still adulterated. But yes, the food, the chemicals that are used in a food plant have to be food grade and have to be, um, uh, especially if they're on the food contact surfaces, but um, because 
what makes a food grade chemical is the components that make this chemical are not hazardous. They don't cause carcinogens and aren't going to be a health hazard if we accidentally leave some of those residues um, on a piece of equipment. Okay. Last two questions. Please don't post any more questions because we almost half an hour now over. So, Gabrielle, <laughs> Listeria innocua, is it okay for an auditor? And I'm not sure if I understand the, the question, but anytime you start dealing with Listeria, um, um, any auditor is going to have a problem with that. And that's going to grab, that's that's going to make our antennas go up and, 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 and get excited to find out what are we doing, um, you know, to control that, uh, did it impact the products? So, um, uh, you know, for any auditor, whether it's a, a third party such as myself, regulatory auditor, when you're talking listeria, which could be life-threatening to some demographics, it's going to be a concern and an issue. So we have to control that. Okay, great. And this is the final question. Uh, from Roland, how do you prove the importance to management when there has not been a class one recall for a product like ours? How do you prove the importance to management that there has not been? Um, there, there's a lot of ways, so Roland. I'm glad you asked that question. This is what I love in the teaching and training is, I mean, you got even quality issues are not acceptable. We're going to lose customers. Um, you know, customers going to be pushed away from our product just because, you know, there's three different types of recalls, class one, two, and three. Class one recall means injury, illness, or death. Class two means a medically reversible condition. And class three is a quality issue. So even if it's a class three, Roland, it's still a problem. And we have a potential for losing customers um, and having customer complaints. And it's still uh, a legal issue because it's, uh, you know, maybe the products is adulterated. Okay, brilliant. Uh, nearly 30 minutes over. So that was amazing. I mean, Obviously, we had uh, 1,500 people registered and well over 300 online. So, and it's a topic that, you know, is one that's quite complex and people struggle with. So, mm -hmm. thanks very much for sharing your uh, wisdom and experience today, Jesse. Really appreciate it and the time, extra time that you put in. So, appreciate it. No problem, Simon. And thank you for having me and look forward to doing some of these webinars in the future with you. Definitely, we'll be. Uh, we'll have to do one uh, on cleaning again in the uh, next season next year. So thanks yep, everyone for like attending. This. Yeah, you're finishing now for the holiday period, Jesse. Is that right? Yes, uh, actually, uh, as soon as we get done with this class, I'm on vacation. That's why I had all the Great. time in the world for you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, enjoy your vacation and everybody, if you're having a break uh, between now and New Year, uh, thanks for your sticking with us this year and we look forward to bringing you more great webinars next year. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next year. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, folks.